Hi everyone, welcome to Pac-12 Softball, The Final Swing. I'm your host, Ilya Jordan. If you don't know who I am, I played at UCLA for seven years, was there from 2017 to 2023, so I just just finished my career, uh, 2019 national champion and two-time All-American. Um, now I do this. <laughs> so I'm here to cover the Pac-12 for its unfortunate final year, but... I'm really excited. I'm, I love doing this. And so let's just get straight into it. We are in week three of Pac-12 play, which is crazy. I feel like the season has just flown by. Let's start off with none other, none other than UCLA. UCLA had their bye week this week. They only played one, well, they played one game in a midweek against Rutgers and then um, only played two games against LMU. Won both games eight to zero in five innings. And I'm told that it's rare for a team that has their bye week to get weekly Pac-12 awards, but nonetheless, UCLA's Caitlin Terry got Freshman of the Week and Charlize Palacios got Player of the Week. Charlize was a perfect 5-for-5 five five from the plate over three games, drove in a team-high seven runs to lead UCLA to a 3-0 week. She went 3-for-3 three three with a double in the 7-6 win over Rutgers and also had two RBIs. She hit her sixth career Grand Slam to win, to win against LMU and got a season high five RBIs in the same game. So congratulations to Charlize. KT, Caitlin Terry, the freshman pitcher, went 2-0 and in the circle, striking out 12 batters over 8.2 innings. She then struck out seven over 3.2 innings with three hits allowed in the 7-6 win over Rutgers and pitched a five-inning complete game shutout against LMU, striking out five for her eighth win of the season. Congratulations, KT. Now let's talk about the Pac-12 series. Starting off with Oregon and Utah. Oregon took the series 2 to 1 against Utah. In game 1, Oregon won 20 to 3, which is crazy. You don't see scores like that very often in softball. In that game, Oregon had 17 hits, which is their their offense came to play that day for sure. In game 2, Oregon scored 7 times in the first 3 innings, but Utah scored 7 of their own runs in the 4th and 5th inning and then eventually went on to win 10 to 7. So at this point the series was even. Then in game 3, Oregon came and won 5 to 1 to take the series. So kudos to them. Now let's go talk about the Washington versus Arizona series. Washington took the series 2 to 1, another split of course. Washington won game 1 via run rule 13 to 2 and game 2 via run rule 11 to 3. Across both those games, UW had 26 hits, while Arizona only had 8. I said it was going to be a home run fest in Tucson last week, and of course it was. UW had 8 home runs across the first two games. I mean, it's not surprising. I mean, that Tucson air is so thin, the ball just flies. You can get jammed and the ball's going to go over the fence. Um, but yeah, they had 8 home runs across the first two games. And then game three is where Arizona took it in 1-2-0. UW actually only had three hits that game. And so in that game, I, that's just kind of shocking because how do you go from 26 hits the first two games to then only having three hits? Um, and it's not like Arizona has that many pitchers, so they had to have faced the same pitchers. Um, so it's interesting that they did, offense just didn't come to play that day. Um, so in that game, after five scoreless innings, Arizona brought their first runs across in a two-run home run by none other, none other than Olivia Gennardo in the bottom of the six. And after that, UW just couldn't get it done, couldn't seem to score after that. So let's talk about the ASU and Oregon State series. And yet another split, Oregon State took the series two to one. In game one, ASU was actually winning three to one until the sixth, when Oregon State then hit a two-run home run, two-run home run by Ileana Gottlieb. Then in the seventh, Lisey Campbell hit a two-run home run to make it five-three. In game two, the scores went back and forth. By the end of the fourth, it was four to three ASU, or sorry, Oregon State. Then in the sixth, ASU made it five to four, and then in the seventh, Oregon State scored six to win the game 10 to 5. In game three, ASU used five runs spread across the fifth and sixth innings to take the series finale from Oregon State and win 5-0. In that game, neither team was able to score a run until the fifth inning when Jordan Van Hook came in as a pinch hitter 
and delivered a two-run double to give ASC the take. Sorry, to give ASC the lead with two outs in the ASU six. Samantha Swan walked and Sarah Kinch singled in front of Libby Wash, who then delivered a three-run home run to left to extend the Sun Devils' lead to 5-0. Obviously ended up winning that game. Let's talk about the Cal versus Stanford series. Stanford swept Cal this weekend, and I'm honestly kind of shocked. I thought, I know Stanford's so good, and their pitching is amazing, but I just, I don't know. I just, I had faith that Cal would at least take one of those games. Um, guess not. The scores of the games were 7-0, 5-2, and then 7-4. And I feel like it's really easy to say that Cal just didn't have a great weekend offensively. But I mean, we really just have to give credit to Stanford's pitching staff. I mean, they're just doing such an amazing job. Nyjah Kennedy, of course, but also Alyssa Houston and Reagan Krause. Speaking of Reagan Krause, she was the pitcher of the week this week. Uh, she picked up three wins for Stanford, including two against number 17 Cal. She began the week tossing a complete game shutout against Sac State, sorry, Sacramento State, striking out a career high 10 while carrying a no hitter into the sixth inning. She struck out five over 4.2 innings against Cal, allowing just one earned run. And she recorded another win in the circle in the 7 4 victory over Cal again, going for 2, 4.2 innings to steal the sweep. Congratulations to her. She was supposed to be on the podcast today, but then their game ended up getting pushed up so she wasn't able to come so hopefully we can get her on the get her on the podcast here soon that is all I have as far as recaps um let's talk about this upcoming weekend so number 19 Cal will host number 21 Arizona that'll be an interesting series I mean number 19 versus number 21 they're pretty even um I'm not sure who's gonna take that series I don't want to make any guesses I feel like for the most part every time I make a guess there I end up being wrong um, but that'll be a cool series to watch. Ninth-ranked Stanford will take on Utah at home. The Utes actually swept Stanford last season for their first season sweep of the Cardinals since 2017. But Stanford is 8-1 and one at home this season, so we'll see who takes that series. That'll be a good one to watch as well. ASU will host Oregon. My favorite series of the weekend number 14 UCLA and number eight Washington who are currently second and third in the pack will square off in a highly anticipated three-game series in Seattle I always loved going to Seattle it's so beautiful they have such a nice facility it's just so much fun these two programs have combined for a 60 for combined for 67 NCAA tournament and 46 women's college world series appearances but UCLA has won seven of the last eight matchups between the two programs, as well as six straight games in Seattle against the Huskies. So this will be interesting. I think they start playing within 30 minutes after I film this, so I gotta hurry and get on that get on that game. Washington is four and one at home this season though, so this weekend will be Washington's tenth game against a ranked opponent that they will face this year. So I think this will be very, very, very good game, or uh, not even game, series um, for both teams. So that is what's happening this coming weekend. Now let's break down each of these Pac-12 teams. Let's start off with, of course, UCLA. In terms of batting, Janelle Mionio is leading the team with a batting average of 455. My Brady's next in average with at 382. She's also leading the team in RBIs at 30. We also have to talk about Shirley's Palacios. Like I said before, she was the Pac-12 Player of the Week this week, but she's just coming through for UCLA as of recently. She has the second most RBIs at 21 on the team at least, and just has been the one to spark the fire for them in the in those pressure situations in the past couple games. She's really like coming of her own, so that's been really cool to watch. Pitching, Taylor Tinsley is, of course, the ace. She's got a 1.96 ERA and 71.1 innings pitched. But we're starting to see more of the freshman, Caitlin Terry, who also was Pac-12 freshman of the week. <laughs> She's come through a little bit more for them. And I think as the season goes on, it'll be interesting to see how she does against the tougher teams. I think right now we clearly see Taylor Tinsley who um, getting the bigger starts against some of the tougher opponents. But at some point... You know, we haven't really seen Jada Cecil right now, so 
as they're starting to face these tougher teams, they're going to have to tag team um, and complement each other. And so I think it'll be really interesting to see how that dynamic goes. Um, but we're definitely going to have to see more of Caitlin Terry in order for them to get past these tougher opponents. Overall, I think UCLA is just doing so much better of a job each week. But I still think they have room to get better, but they definitely each week they've been climbing the the rankings and the polls and so I think definitely this week when this weekend will be a great weekend to show the world if the, you know they're meant to get keep climbing those polls um, let's go on over to Oregon in terms of batting Kai Lucher is batting 461 she's obviously their most consistent hitter in terms of getting on base not only that but she's got 18 stolen bases she's 18 for 22 attempts so anytime she gets a single it's almost a guarantee that she's gonna get over to second on a steal R.L. Carson, she's having a great year for Oregon. She's batting 370, but she leads the team in RBIs with 31, home runs with 8, and doubles with 6. Those two definitely getting it done, but it's not only them. It's also Valerie Wong. Alyssa Daniel is also in that core group. In terms of pitching, it's Claire Morgan Scott's their, their ace. She's got the most innings at 58.2 and a 6-4 and four record. The freshman Taylor Spencer has the next most innings at 45. She has a 2.49 ERA and a 5.5 and 2 record. I think offensively, I think Oregon is more than capable of scoring runs. We've seen that they just won 20 to three, but I think in order for them to continue having success, their pitching staff is gonna have to show up for them consistently and on the same day that their offense does. Cal, I mean, you've heard these names all the time for Cal: Acacia Anders and Elon Butler. They're the offensive leaders for Cal. Keisha Anders is batting 409. She's got 13 doubles and 25 RBIs. Last year, though, she batted. Is that, is that a word? <laughs> she hit 284, seven doubles, and 30 RBIs. Elon Butler has a Pac 12 leading, 10 home runs, and 27 RBIs. And last year, she batted. I keep saying that word. I don't really know if that's a word, but I'm going to keep saying it. Last year, she hit 272, had 10 home runs, and 31 RBIs. So Elon Butler and Acacia Anders are already doing better than they did last year. I mean, we see it. We see how well Cal's doing this year. Um, so them alone, they're just they're they're holding it down for Cal. In terms of pitching, the freshman Randy Rowling is their ace with 75.2 innings pitch. She has a 2.68 ERA and an 8 and 4 record. I think if you look at Cal overall, especially compared to last year, they're definitely having a much, much better year. They're in the top 25. I think they're ranked 19 right now. And, you know, last year they didn't have too great of a year. But, you know, they've dropped some games this year, like to Oregon, and I would have liked to see them do better against Stanford. But overall, I'm very, very pleased with Cal, and I think that they will continue to do well. And I think they'll definitely end up in the top, I want to say three or four um, in the Pac-12, but I think if they can continue to get better each week, then they'll do some great things. Utah. Utah, in terms of batting, Abby Dayton leads the team with a 472 batting average. She has 15 RBIs. Haley Denning, batting 453, 9 RBIs. Kayla Nelson's batting 381 with 9 doubles and 21 RBIs. But it's interesting because those are the top three. And then the next closest batting average is 305. Um, there's just a really a huge drop down, um, a really big gap in between their batting averages. And they only have 10 home runs on the season as a, as a team, which is really interesting. I mean, I know if you've never seen it or been there, Utah's f field is humongous. I don't know what exactly the distance of the... Um, actually, I want to say... I want to say the center field is like 225 or something crazy. There, It's a huge field. I mean, the air center, the ball flies. But So it makes sense why maybe they have a little less home runs, but they only have 10 on the season as a whole. That is, I want, I want to know like what that ranking is nationally or maybe at least in the Pac-12. It has to be, at the, uh, I don't know. I'm not sure. But it's definitely in the lower end in terms of Pac-12. For pitching, Mariah Lopez is their ace, and Sarah Ladd is a close second. Lopez has 68 innings pitch, 9 to 5 record, 9 and 5 record, and a 2.75 ERA. Sarah Ladd has a 3.4 ERA. She has 68 innings pitch and a 7 5 record. Utah right now is 1 and 5 in conference, and last you know last season they came in second. 
in the Pac-12 and then won the Pac-12 tournament. I'm still salty about that a little bit. But they did so good last year. I mean, they made it to the Women's College World Series, and them now being 1-5 in in conference is just not what I think the world expected. Um, I mean, so speaking of, like, you know, the home runs, last year Alyssa Bonstrom now graduated. She had 11 home runs. Carly Davison, who's still on the team, she also hit 11 home runs, but she only has two this year. So I guess it kind of makes sense, like, Alyssa graduating Alyssa Bonstrom, who had majority of their hits or their home runs, and then Carly Davison not having as good of a year. Um, so it kind of makes sense why their offensive is, offense is a little down this year. I think overall, I think they're just not having the best year that they did, the best year that they have had in the last couple of years, especially when you compare them to last year. Washington, the SDSU transfer, Jillian Solis, is batting 375 with 11 doubles, 6 home runs, and 30 RBIs. Alana Johnson is batting 384, 6 home runs, and 20 RBIs. Batting-wise, I mean, they're pretty consistent for the most part. They've got one of the best, if not the best, base runner in Pac-12 with Brooklyn Carter. If you've never seen the girl run, it's crazy. She's fast. She's 16 for 16 on stolen base attempts. She is so risky, such a smart base runner. She does things that I've never seen anybody ever do before. I think she's only a sophomore too, but I remember watching her as a freshman and I was like, this girl's insane, but I loved it. She's just so aggressive and just has so much confidence in herself. And I love that Coach Tar just lets her be her and do whatever on the base paths. Um, I mean, it's for the most part, I think 99% of the time it works out in her favor. So. Definitely got one of the best base runners there. Pitching, we all know Ruby Malin is their ace with 60 innings, 1.52 ERA, and an 8 and 3 record. Overall, UW's just one of the most consistent teams in the pack. They're definitely going to end up, I, I say, top two, if not number one in the pack in the end. Uh, let's go over to Arizona. Carly Skupin is batting 345 with 35, 34 RBIs and seven home runs. Reagan Shockey is batting 421, and Dakota Kennedy is batting 410. I mean, they've got the run producers like Olivia DiNardo and Ali Skaggs with 18 RBIs each. Pitching, their pitching staff's really interesting. So Aisa Silva has 73 innings pitch, and the Kentucky transfer Miranda Studdard has 72 innings pitch. But Silva has only started 10 games, She's but she's appeared in 23. She has a 1.82 ERA and a 12-3 and record. Stoddard has started 12, but appeared in 21 and has a 2.82 ERA and a 2-4 and record. Um, I mean, their pitching staff is pretty small, so there's only so much they can do, which is probably why you see them in a lot of games. They have to tag team for sure. Uh, they have such a strong offense, but I just don't think that their offense always shows up when they need to, and I think that if they could just show up day in and day out, I mean, they've got that thin air. They got the thin air on their side, so they can hit home runs. They can produce runs. I just don't think they always show up, and I would love to see them show up every single day, every game, prepared to hit the home runs, score the runners, have the clutch hitting, and I just don't see that yet. Oregon State. Oregon State's team batting average is 232, with their highest batting average from Grace Mesmer with a 326. Pitching, um, they have another small pitching staff. They only have three pitchers. Ellie Garcia and Sarah Hendages seem to be their top two with Ellie Garcia with 84 innings pitched and Sarah Hendages with 74. Overall, I just think they're having another tough year, which is sad because just two years ago, you know, we saw them at the Women's College World Series, which was huge for them. And then this year, you know, they have a losing record. So they still do compete and take a game from some teams. I mean, like they just did Arizona, but... Overall, they just aren't having the best season. ASU, Tanya Wendell is batting 427 with 8 doubles and 17 RBIs. Alicia Denby's only batting 299, but she has 7 home runs and 21 RBIs. In terms of pitching, Mac Osborne seems, seems to be ASU's ace, and she has the most innings, but Marissa Schuld and Deborah Jones are close in innings, as Marissa has 46.2 and Deborah Jones has 53.2. Their ERAs as average, sorry, their ERAs average as a staff is a little bit higher. It's 3.87. And I think overall, I think 
ASU is doing better than they were last year. They're still competing. They're still taking games like just like they did against Washington. So I think they definitely have a lot of room to grow. But I mean, they still show up to their games and they're still competing. So I'm excited to see who else they take a couple games from. And then last but not least, we have Stanford. It's interesting because Stanford only has two players batting above 300 and their highest is 329. And their highest RBI leader is, or leaders, I should say, are Ali Kanshiro and Jade Berry. But other than that, they don't have like one star that's getting it done, which I think is could be really good because they're collectively using one through nine to get their offensive going. Um, so I think there, because there isn't just one person, you know, it takes the whole collective, which is good. Um, I'm hoping they can keep that up. And then when we talk about their pitching, of course, they have quite literally one of the best pitching staffs in the country. Nyjah Kennedy has a .42 ERA, 9-2 record, only five earned runs. Five earned runs is crazy. 145 strikeouts. We got Reagan Krause, 2.58 ERA, 9-1 ERA, record, and 59 innings pitch. Their, their staff, their pitching staff is just amazing. I hope they can keep this up. I know they'll go far. They'll definitely end up being top two, maybe top three in the Pac-12. Um, so they're just getting it done. I'm really excited to see what they do for the rest of the season. So that's all I have for you for Pac-12 softball this week. Thank you again, everyone, for tuning in. Like I said, or like I always say, I should say, subscribe, um, like and subscribe to the Softball America channel for all things college softball. Check back in here next Friday for all things Pac-12. See you next time.